we can continue with mine. <laughs> that I'm sure that Zafidis did not mean to say that female education in uh, the advanced countries was responsible for the breakdown of the family and the rise of uh, out-of-wedlock uh, births, because in fact there are many other factors that uh, are associated with that, including, especially in the United States, the role of various media with their own agenda, and also poverty. In the United States, family breakdown, out-of-wedlock births, and in particular, teenage pregnancy is co-related with poverty and undereducation. So, uh, and of course, Northern Europe has a different pattern, but this is a, uh, a topic for a much broader discussion. Now, uh, first I'd like to begin by thanking um, the uh, organizers of this conference, the Institute, and in particular, Mrs. Amina for the kind uh, invitation and for organizing this excellent, um, very important and valuable um, uh, seminar. And, you know, if we want to discuss uh, the family as an agent of uh, development, and if we want to discuss um, work-family balance, the work-family agenda, we have to begin by uh, discussing women's relationship to work as well as women's relationship to the family. So, what are the issues here when it comes to women and work? Um, I have over here summarized very uh, succinctly some of the major issues and trends globally in that first column and in the second column pertaining specifically to our region of the Middle East and North Africa, the Arab countries and also Iran and Turkey. Um, across the globe, we have uh, what um, Espa, uh, Gosta Esping Anderson has referred to as uh, the commodification of labor, including female labor commodification, which means, which refers to female labor force attachment, um, and which Guy Standing uh, of formerly of the ILO uh, referred to as the feminization of, pop, uh, of uh, labor. What he meant by that was that um, labor and employment was being feminized in two senses. First, in quantitative sense, that is to say, more women were coming into the workforce, but also that in the context of privatization, liberalization, flexible labor markets, i.e. all of that within the context of neoliberal globalization, that work conditions, employment conditions, were also becoming feminized, that is to say, lower status, poor deteriorating conditions, and so on. But across the world in general, we have this labor force attachment. We have the situation of female labor commodification. But in that context, as more and more women across the globe have entered the workforce, the issue of their double burden has also come to the fore. That is to say, women are uniquely responsible for both production and reproduction. Uh, and reproduction, referring obviously to not only biological reproduction of the physical act of giving birth, but also taking care of children, taking care of the home, and also taking care of elderly um, relatives, which uh, we find um, that as women age, they also have to uh, take care of, of older uh, relatives in addition to taking care of children when they're younger. So that's women's double burden. Now. Uh, to address this, there are, across the world, variable uh, policies for work-family balance, i.e. variable policies to address this double burden, which is uniquely, specifically, an issue that women face, which uh, Zafidis, in fact, showed very nicely with one of his, um, one of his slides or cartoons. Um, and in uh, some countries, these policies are inadequate, and in other countries, um, they, are, um, they are much more generous. Now, across the globe, what then becomes the advocacy or the policy goal? It is decommodification, using the language of Esping Anderson, um, or, which I will talk about in the next slide, social rights or economic citizenship for women to address this question of their double burden, but also to address the kinds of supports that working mothers need within the labor force. And there are also issues with respect to migrant domestic, uh, domestic labor. What we have seen across the world is as more women, and this pertains also to the advanced 
industrialized countries. As more women have joined the workforce, there is also um, increasing pressures on the time of, in particular, professional women. Professional women with um, um, very uh, uh, heavy, for example, administrative or managerial uh, responsibilities. And therefore, those are the kinds of women who will employ um, migrant uh, labor to work as nannies, housekeepers, and so on and so forth. So uh, this is a pattern that we know very well that exists here in the GCC as well as in Lebanon and in Jordan. And we're seeing this in some um, uh, uh, parts of the world um, and in a much smaller part of the female uh, population, very elite female labor force. Now, what do we see in the Middle East? What are some of the um, issues there? Well, um, with respect to, uh, to the Middle East, I'm looking for the mouse and I can't seem to find it. Um, oh, there we go. Uh, with respect to the Middle East, um, as I think most of us know in this room, that there are very low rates of female labor force participation in the Middle East and North Africa region. Um, this table shows um, the Middle East and North Africa, that last uh, row, in relation to other regions in uh, the world economy. This is data from the World Bank, and so all these um, figures come from a, a single source. Um, as you can see here, what is actually very interesting is that, of course, the MENA region, uh, this labor force attachment, or the, these female uh, labor force participation rates, are much lower in uh, MENA than they are in terms of the world average, much lower than Latin America and the Caribbean, and also much lower than um, South Asia. We see that, for example, in Latin America and the Caribbean, there's been um, a very um, substantial increase between 19, the 1980s and the new century. We have not seen that kind of substantial, significant increase in female labor force participation in MENA between the 1980s and uh, the present century. And this next table uh, focuses on the region itself and the countries within the region. Um, I've been working on female employment issues since the 19, latter part of the 1980s. Um, and I know that there are some issues with uh, you know, data, uh, inconsistency, and so on and so forth. Um, but uh, but this, this, these are the data, um, and uh, these are official uh, figures, and they're also official figures that are then re reported to the World Bank. And the World Bank data might disagree with some other international data sets, but we're working with, uh, with these data right now. Um, as you can see, uh, there are some variations across the region, but again, um, not substantial increases in the female share of the labor force between 1990 and uh, 2010, and in a few cases there have been declines. So in other words, that labor force attachment that has been attained in most part of, parts of the world, that female labor commodification has not yet occurred in, um, uh, in our region. Um, now, one reason for the absence of the um, uh, or these small, these low figures for, for women um, has to do with the patriarchal gender contract. Now, there are political economy reasons too. Um, back in the early 1990s, I made an argument about how the oil economy actually limits the supply of female labor, but also demand for female labor. Um, but in more recent years, I have come to the conclusion that it is not only the oil sector, oil revenues, and the oil economy that is responsible. There is also this patriarchal gender contract as a kind of a, an ideal. The ideal being male breadwinner, female homemaker. And this ideal we see inscribed in various um, attitudes and norms, such as ones that uh, Dr. Rudy showed um, in her presentation, especially those attitudes on the part of Iraqi men. Um, but also, they, you see them uh, inscribed in some legal frameworks, particularly in family laws in a number of countries. Um, now, Morocco is a country that reformed its family law very, very significantly in 2003-2004. Um, but I have found that family law also is an institutional barrier to female labor mobility, to the supply uh, of, uh, of female labor and to demand for female labor. So uh, these are some of the issues. 
Um, we also find that there are uh, insignificant uh, or inadequate policies to support uh, maternal employment. Um, in joint work that I have done with uh, Dr. Karshanas, we have found that there is a class basis for these trends and patterns in female labor force participation. It is mostly educated women who work. Um, women from low income and from working class families generally do not work. And uh, there are real reasons for this. It is the lack of institutional support mechanisms for women from lower income and working class families. So what are some of these? Now, I have not gone to the uh, extent of looking at national policies, but if we look at this table here on international uh, conventions um, that have some relationship to women work and family, uh, we've seen that, um, and I have two tables here, um, that many of the countries, many of the Middle East, North African countries, have signed on to some of these um, you know, more significant international conventions, such as the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, albeit with sweeping reservations that basically asserted that where um, the convention disagreed with national law or with Sharia law, then Sharia law would take precedence. And um, that basically nullified the, uh, the spirit of the convention, but uh, some countries now have uh, done away with the, with the reservations. We have other uh, international conventions too, the International Covenant on um, Civil, uh, uh, sorry, on, well, Civil and Political Rights, but uh, primarily Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights. That is the convention that pertains to economic citizenship, which I'll talk about in one moment too. But if we look at those last two conventions on maternity protection and on workers uh, with uh, the ILO Convention on Workers with Family Responsibilities, none of the countries has signed those conventions. So this is you know, um, an example of these inadequate um, uh, ways of addressing international um, uh, work family issues and especially women work and family issues. Um, this is a separate table on the GCC countries. And uh, here you will see again that the GCC countries have signed a number of these important international conventions that have to do with uh, women, work, and family. Um, but uh, some of the ones that are most pertinent to women and work, and the conventions that are most pertinent to a pattern here in GCC which has to do with the extent of migrant labor that exists in this region, have not been signed by um, uh, the, uh, the governments here. So, for example, the International Convention on the Protection of the Rights and Migrant Workers and Their Families. What I have found, incidentally, when I have looked at the different countries throughout the world that have signed or not signed, it's basically the sending countries that have signed onto this convention. The receiving countries generally don't sign onto this convention. Um, again, the ILO Convention on Workers with Family Responsibilities, none of the countries have signed on. Maternity protection, none of them have signed on. And the most recent ILO convention from 2011 on domestic workers, giving rights to domestic workers, none of the countries has yet to sign on to that uh, particular one. So I think it's, uh, uh, that's one issue to, to bear uh, in mind. So what is our um, you know, advocacy here? We need to enhance female labor force participation. We need to get those numbers up. We need to increase those female shares of the labor force, which are so much smaller in this region than in um, uh, other parts of the world. <clears throat> and what are the goals? So obviously one of the goals is um, decommodification. So Esping Anderson talks about how um, you know, workers have certain um, uh, roles to play within the system of production, within the accumulation system. But then we have to have the process of decommodification, which then T.H. Marshall describes as the social rights of citizens, or ILO and others talk about labor rights. Okay, so once you're in the labor force, it's not just a question of working under any conditions, but it's also what the ILO calls decent work, the decent work agenda, or what others uh, point to as social rights and uh, economic citizenship work-family balance, recognition of care work, whether that care work is paid work or unpaid work. If it's paid work, 
that kind of care work, for example, by having you know domestic servants and such, then that is where certain policies are absolutely needed to ensure the labor rights and the human rights of paid domestic workers, workers who come into the home to care for children, elderly, and so on. Or unpaid work, that's the work that, for example, the women in the family um, um, uh, uh, perform, and some of the recognition or the valorization of female unpaid work within the home can take the form of, for example, those family allowances that Dr. Karshanas mentioned, or um, tax credits, or elder care benefits, or some other types of trans uh, cash transfers, um, or other uh, types of social provisioning um, to, uh, to, uh, uh, to alleviate this kind of unpaid uh, reproductive labor. So what then do we mean by um, the social rights of citizenship? And this is from uh, T.H. Marshall, the great theorist of citizenship, and I have here just um, synthesized his theory and his enumeration of the civil, political, and then social and economic rights of citizenship. Um, and I've also um, amended this a little bit um, to, um, uh, to uh, um, account for contemporary times and, and also for you know, different regions. So the right to contract, and that's any kind of contract. That's a work contract, it's a business contract, it's a marriage contract, for example. Um, equal treatment under the law, freedom of expression, religion, the right to privacy, control over one's body. This is especially uh, pertinent to women and their reproductive rights and control over their fertility, which obviously they have attained. Um, in, uh, in most of the Middle East in particular as a result of higher educational attainment and also government policy, choice of residence and choice of occupation. So these are the civil rights that um, T.H. Marshall um, uh, enumerated with some adjustments on, on my part. Political rights also, and then the social rights, which, which is what I'm really focused on health services, family allowances, primary and secondary schooling, higher education, vocational education, compensatory rights, this is compensation for workplace accidents, and these sorts of things, social insurance, paid maternity leave, and subsidized quality childcare. Okay. Now, in this table, um, what I have done here then is to look at the different forms of employment that exist across the globe, actually. Now, this I um, adapted from um, uh, uh, an edited volume by Rosemary Crompton, um, and there she identified um, five forms of employment with their uh, specific gender class relationship. I added a sixth one because I thought that sixth one pertains most to the Middle East, North Africa. Now the original, and then what I added were the support mechanisms from the market, support mechanisms from the state for each of these types of employment. Okay. By the way, the one that I added for this region is the male breadwinner marketized carer. So let's just quickly go over this. The male breadwinner, female, so by the way, this goes from most traditional to most egalitarian. So, male uh, breadwinner, female carer. Then I have this list of what kind of support mechanisms from the market either exist or should exist. What support mechanisms from the state either exist or should exist. Okay, so I've just prepared this as a kind of guideline or a set of some recommendations. Now, I was also thinking of adding a third column, which is support mechanisms from civil society. Um, in Quebec, for example, there is something that is called the social economy, the solidarity economy. Um, this is an, a different sector. It is not a state sector. It is not a market sector. It is a non-profit cooperative sector. But it is a se sector where, for example, you will find child care centers, non-profit child care cooperatives, but they receive some subsidy and some support 
from local authorities or from provincial authorities. But because that is so uh, country and regional specific, I decided not to include that, that column, but we could include it at some point. Um, male breadwinner, female part-time earner. Male breadwinner, marketized carer. This is um, a phenomenon that you, this is a pattern that we find here in the GCC and in Lebanon and in Jordan. The dual earner and the state carer. That's where the husband and wife work. But also, this really pertains to, for example, Northern Europe, uh, where you know government provides also some kind of support for families where both um, husband and wife are full-time employees. Um, then the dual uh, earner marketized carer. Uh, that, for example, is very common in the United States, where you have the husband and wife who are both working, but they also employ somebody to come clean the house or to take care of their um, you know, children from time to time and so on. And finally, the most egalitarian um, is the dual earner, dual carer. That is to say, both husband and wife work, and both of them work within the house. <laughs> so they are both um, involved in production and in reproduction, let's put it that way, without um, external help. But they need help. Because, of course, there are only so many days, uh, oh, so many hours in a day in which people can you know, um, uh, uh, address other issues. So um, this is what I have um, put together just for this presentation. Um, but um, but in, uh, I also want to finally leave you with one last set of uh, social rights um, for women's economic citizenship in uh, the Arab region um, and beyond. So I think these are the uh, social uh, policies or the reforms that will be needed to help increase female labor force participation, to help increase women's entry into the labor force in order that they may um, contribute to household well-being, to child well-being, and to the creation, the formation of the family as an engine of development and growth. So the first, uh, the first one, let's see, item one and item three and item four are more or less more specific to our region. Although, by the way, equality and family inheritance also does not exist in some African countries, sub-Saharan African countries, so that's a goal over there too. But in general, all of these policies pertain to women in, um, well, throughout the world, basically. So these are some of the policies that will be needed in, in addition to the table that I just showed that will um, create this kind of um, work-family balance for women, but that in the Middle East in particular will help us to attain um, uh, greater social development through greater female economic participation. Thank you. Great.